yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that around me as well. And I think almost everyone can identify at least one person who they would like to help. Um, how, how do you recommend going about this if you want to help someone you love uh, who might not know? I think most often they won't recognize, right, that they're suffering from this uh, or they might be hesitant or may not like being told uh, that, that this is what they're experiencing. How do you recommend we help people? So, Krisha, just returning to your initial statement, we all know it's, I mean, it's anecdotal, but we also think that possibly 10, 15 percent of the population in this moment in time are locked into the syndrome. Things might improve naturally for many of them as the environment unlocks, okay? And some may be left behind but, uh, and need, need support. Uh, but it's true. Every time I talk to somebody, they will mention an individual that fits the four criteria. Attention to threat, avoidance, worrying, and checking. Mm. It's also happened recently when I was involved in interviews with journalists where they told me either that they <laughs> were experiencing the problem or a parent. It, the message that I'm getting is that there are a lot of people over the age of 60 vaccinated who are avoiding a lot, especially avoiding, disconnected from others. So we might find over time that those who suffer the most might be people who have existing conditions like diabetics mm -hmm. or people more at risk, let's say over 60s. Mm -hmm. So we'll find out. So that's why I said, returning to what we were discussing earlier, the demographic link to the COVID-19 anxiety syndrome might, might switch over time. But yes, every time I talk to somebody, they say, I've got a person at work I know, <laughs> or I, it's incredible. What can we do? to help them uh, or, well, to help ourselves. Because my belief is that most of us are on the continuum of the COVID-19 anxiety syndrome. And we might not even be aware until we return to normal, until we have to be in the tube with other people, until we have to um, get onto an airplane, until we have to be in a meeting room that feels very Crowd. full, crowded. Uh, until it's that season where viruses are going around. We will not know fully because many of us have been avoidant. So message number one, it's a, a, can I call it a normal state to be in to an extent because we've gone through the pandemic, which is a, a traumatizing event collectively. And several people many people have, have died and we will inevitably know of people who've been very ill or have died. So first is normalization. Second of all, it's um, gradually returning to what we used to do. So I would recommend, for example, those returning to offices, which might happen in the UK, sort of between July and September, that um, it's done in such a manner maybe where the, the density uh, of individuals or the number of individuals in an office space is limited to begin with, even if social distancing is not needed, uh, then maybe people might not need to return uh, all at the same time. So they return in groups. Uh, people might come to work at different times of the day, some at seven, some at eight, some at nine, some at 10 and I'm thinking mainly of office workers. Um, if people want to wear a mask for their own safety, even if masks were to be removed, which I think is what happened in Denmark or is happening in Israel, if I'm correct, there's no gaslighting. You know, there's not, you know, no mockery. You know, what's wrong with you? Are you vaccinated six, seven times with booster vaccines? What's the matter with you? All that, not even as a joke. So we facilitate the return. If people want to sanitize their hands or if they're uncomfortable, we try to create that space where, although there are safety behaviors, assuming that the virus is not that threatening anymore, 
at least people are reconnecting. Yeah. If, if the checking and the worry have become entrenched, then for those who are on the sort of lighter side of the spectrum, the COVID-19 anxiety syndrome, there are various techniques that can be used to interrupt worry um, uh, and checking. Um, they include um, practices such as attention training, where we learn to modify our attention and train it so we can switch in, in and out of threat. Learning to sort of uh, catch ourselves as the worry begins. We're going to, towards the television, turning on the TV, checking the news, and we catch ourselves and say, no, we'll come back to that later. I will only check the news once every two days. Uh, etc. So a series of techniques, standard techniques for postponing worry. But for those whose problems have become more entrenched, mm -hmm. then I think a brief course of behavioral and cognitive th therapies where you go into, into, into the worry and to the avoidance, to checking a little bit in more detail you look at the beliefs you might have about worry and the benefits of playing movies about what might go wrong or continuously checking for, for information. You, you look at that in a more personalized, tailor-made way to discontinue it. Mm -hmm. So I've done that over the last six months with maybe three or four clients, patients, where we've planned a graded return to life, going to the pub, outside, then indoors, then with a few people, then with some people we haven't seen for a long time, uh, learning techniques, specific behavioral and cognitive techniques to postpone the worry, um, et cetera, uh, reducing the checking, reducing the sanita sanitizing of the hands from 12 times a day to 10, to eight, to six, uh, et cetera. And many of these clients have now returned, you know, within the restrictions we have that are almost entirely lifted, they've returned to normal function. So they're seeing people at garden parties. Uh, they are, they're inviting people at home. They are hugging them. Uh, they are shaking hands rather than doing the elbow business. And so most of the people I've worked with have, have returned to pretty much normal functioning. Certainly, Krisha, they watch a lot less news they are sanitizing less their hands because also we know that it's not fundamental. Uh, and they've had to meet people and be with them to disconfirm the belief that they're in danger. There's no way you can disconfirm the belief that you're in danger unless you return to the activities. And they are postponing the worry, not checking as much, not asking people whether they've been vaccinated or not. Uh, not wondering if individuals have been tested. The safety behaviors are gradually removed yeah. so that we return, we return to normal. But fundamental is also linking back to what you said, which is very important, that they are with agreement in therapy. They are sort of co-agreeing. We are co-producing um, the list of data that they will check. Right infection to fatality, demographics, number of people uh, vaccinated, level of immunity, which in the UK is over 80%, um, and information of that kind. Um, so positive cases, not really looked at. Other uh, news to do, whether there will be a lockdown in autumn or not, well, not discussed because we're not in autumn yet. It's very much about remaining in the sort of present and the how and now. Yeah. 